Okay, good afternoon. Uh, I'm Patrick Chad. I'm the Dean for eLearning. And I want to thank you for taking the time to uh, attend this webinar. This webinar certainly stands on its own, but it is in some ways a follow-up to the session that Ginny McGee and I did at Convocation. I'll be talking about outcomes and assessment in reference to student learning. Uh, this topic was in response to a faculty request. So if there are topics of interest to you, please send an email to me directly or to elearning at camdencc.edu. We all do webinars regularly. And so if you send it to elearning at camdencc.edu, we'll all get it. Um, and then we can move forward and really handle the topics that you want to know about. So outcomes and assessment focusing on, on student learning. It's really about uh, student assessment in your course. So the objectives today um, is really to talk about the reasons why it's important to know if our students are achieving the desired outcomes, what we're trying to teach them, um, what the what data, what important data to collect and analyze. Talk briefly about direct and indirect assessments, scheduling of uh, student learning assessments, and then some resources. And the resources are all in PDFs. I have four through the presentation that I will send to all of the attendees of this session if you'd like. Um, they are in PDF format and they're in their good resources. So are students learning? Um, it's really important to determine whether students are achieving the educational outcomes that we've established um, because it, it really is a critical part of the teaching learning process. And student success, of course, is everyone's goal and job and we want them to succeed and move on. And we want them certainly to uh, know and master the information that we are imparting to them. And why is this important? Well, there are a number of reasons for measuring and assessing student learning outcomes. And one of the ones really is about curriculum evaluation. And it's really to confirm that the actual knowledge that students are acquiring by completing the requirements, you know, consistent with the intended goals. So meaningful assessment isn't um, bean counting or teaching to the test. It really um, must be done thoughtfully, systematically. It should be faculty driven so that the information gathered reflects you know, the goals and values of our um, particular disciplines. It helps uh, faculty instructors to kind of refine their teaching practices and to grow as educators. And it really helps the entire department and programs to um, refine their curriculum, you know, really to prepare our students for entering uh, the workplace. Student success, another reason why we do it, it's really to monitor student success across the program, to identify gaps, to suggest initiatives or to come up with initiatives individually to enhance the experience for all students. And one of the most uh, critical components um, is student assessment. And I think that appropriate assessment strategies can really have far reaching impacts on student learning, faculty development. And the aim of this type of assessment is to measure student performance um, in aggregate, as well as to provide a context for improving the course or for you know, a broader part of uh, the academic program. And um, online student assessment is the same but different in a way. So traditional assessment and evaluation really measures the attainment of learning objectives through exams, papers, projects, and, and certainly um, traditional forms of assessment can accomplish certain course objectives. Uh, this is a model um, that I came across that really talks about assessing and evaluating online learning. So the model divides student achievement and course evaluation into three phases, in the initial and pre-course phase, the continuous formative phase, and then the end and summative. And during each phase, you would collect data and analyze to really serve as a guide to, to modify and revise the course and instruction as needed. So it is a representation of, um, let me look at my notes, the O'Neill, Fisher, and Newbold model for assessing and evaluating learning online. If anyone's interested, I can actually do a workshop about around this type of assessment. I just mention it here because we have faculty who teach face-to-face, -face, who teach online, who teach in heart. Um, and this may be something that, that those who teach online are interested in. And, and it's a pretty good 
um, model to use. Also, we want to evaluate alumni success. Now, this isn't a faculty task per se, but it is good to know or to be able to access the data. Um, in recent decades, institutions of higher learning, um, of course, view alumni as valuable sources of financial support, but also as um, source of information. So alumni really offer important perspectives for evaluating academic programs, um, student services, and in some places often are used to uh, for student recruitment and mentoring. And just an example, at another institution, a four-year institution, recent alumni reported a 76% employment placement rate for um, their bachelor degree graduates following their first year of post-graduation life. 83% um, of those employed are in a role related to their academic major, you know, so that's a, it's a really good indicator. And then the rates actually jumped for the graduate degree alumni to 79 um, and 93% uh, respectively. And placement rate was calculated by asking um, uh, recent graduates to report their employment status, pursuit of additional ed education and, and that kind of thing. So, you know, alumni success shows that um, we had a part in giving them the knowledge that they needed to graduate, to succeed, and then to enter the workplace uh, in their particular discipline. We also want to measure effectiveness, um, really to, to gather and aggregate evidence across the program and data uh, in itself. Data is really important because it proves or demonstrates what the process is doing. Um, is it successful? Is it not successful? Um, if yes or no, why? You know, data is uh, primarily the tool that we use to show and to prove and to demonstrate accountability. So accountability, um, is another reason that we do it. So in response to increasing pressure from the public or constituents or accrediting bodies, um, you know, we have to be accountable. We have to demonstrate um, what the students are learning and also the value that they receive from participating, you know, in our programs and services. So accountability is a, is a big important piece of it. And the final reason that I have today, <clears throat> and the reason I have the big red square around it <laughs> is accreditation. So we really need to meet the regional and professional accreditation requirements. And um, Camden County College's regional accreditor, Middle States Commission on Higher Education requires under their standard three, what you see. So this is gonna be a major focus with the medical, uh, the Middle States accreditation coming up. Um, <clears throat> and as it was mentioned at convocation by Dr. Edwards, uh, accreditation is very important, so important that Dr. S Teresa Smith actually has been um, appointed as the head of the accreditation process, and she's already in working on preparing for the visit, which is three years away, but we will have a self-study in between um, now and then. So accreditation, really big reason um, why we should do it and need to do it. So... There are benefits and challenges. We all know that assessment can generate rich information, um, but assessment takes effort um, and there never is enough time, right? To do everything that we want to do, need to do. Um, Planning is required and using our resources. So one of the things that we discussed at Convocation was using resources already in place, such as the tools in Canvas. And I'm sure that there'll be other means, um, plenty of guidance and other tools to help with this process uh, in the near future as Dr. Smith builds up steam. And we're here, of course, to help with anything that we can in terms of using the tools online for your courses to do this kind of assessment. Now, assessment of student learning outcomes. Of course, there are many different uses of the term assessment. So in this context, we're using it to refer to the process of gathering and reviewing evidence to determine um, that our students are achieving the outcomes that we intend, that we want them to. So, um, and I'm not trying to be ignorant or offensive, you know, but I was asked, well, what do you mean by assessment of student learning outcomes um, by several people after the complication session? So this slide, the couple of slides that here are in place because 
of the question that was posed to me. So, you know, we really need to think about um, student learning outcome assessment, which is of course different than assessment of the individual student. And the primary difference um, very simply and very clearly is that, um, you know, the type of assessment uh, we do in overall student learning and the type that we do when we grade like an individual test or paper is how the results are used, how they're analyzed, how they fit into uh, the overall data pool. So student performance data, um, data on student performance, overall student performance is ideally gathered and reviewed in aggregate for the purpose of evaluating how well the learning goals of the program are being accomplished and if improvements should be made. So when we look at it, you're really looking at the data for the collective. Now, um, you can use individual student data um, as evidence for assessment or evaluation purposes. And to do that though, you really have to take those those individual pieces of data um, and aggregate them, of course. And, and by that, you really need to use an agreed upon standard criteria or a rubric. I'm a, I'm a big fan of rubrics for courses, for assessment, um, rubrics at every level, because they really help you stay on track and um, put in the data that you need or that you want to determine the information that, that you're trying to get. And again, so it needs to be rolled up and analyzed in aggregate, in a whole, um, and not on an individual basis. And um, we really have to do it in terms of accreditation. Um, we're also doing assessment for continuous improvement. And continuous improvement is gonna be pretty much tied to um, assessment. It's another phrase that we'll be hearing often in the next few years. And likely going forward, no matter where you are, um, this is a metric that all schools are starting to have to put in place. And in a lot of schools, of course, in the area are accredited by middle states. And even if you go down south, it's really the same thing. Um, you're gonna be hearing continuous improvement, assessment for continuous improvement um, continually and going forward. And it really is about having a never ending cycle of assessment and improvement across, um, and across the entire enterprise. Um, not just academics. So, you know, to be really uh, transparent, the artifact or the tangible data um, is what we have to support our assessment efforts in the simplest form is a document. And it describes what we have done, what we are doing, what we have found in terms of good, bad, gaps, et cetera, um, and what changes that we're, ma we're making. Now, I don't teach here uh, at CCC, but even in e-learning and for those under my purview, it's no different. As a part of accreditation, we have to create this document, this assessment over um, what we do. We have to have the cycle in place and we have to create the documents to support and report what we're doing and, and all that kind of stuff. Everything from what we've done, what we're doing, what we're going to do, gaps that we've identified, and what we're doing to modify and change and improve the program. So this is something that is, um, when accreditation comes in from middle states, they don't look at just the academics. They really do look at the enterprise as a whole. So it's something that everyone's gonna be tasked doing. So <clears throat> assessment plans. Um, ideally, uh, everyone should develop and keep on file an assessment plan. Now, how you want to measure and review your outcomes really depends on you, your courses, your program. Um, some of them are complicated. Some of them need the longitudinal um, assessment. And so it's really a part of the planning process that you um, look at how you're going to um, create this document and what you're going to measure and how you're going to measure it. And you, know, you may want to stagger it across multiple years or multiple semesters and it's really about coming down to figure out what the best plan is that works for you, your area, your course, um, that kind of thing. Now, basic assessment plan, uh, as we mentioned a little bit, a convocation should include a mission statement, intended learning outcome or outcomes, and a description of the methods that you're going to use to gather this data 
to measure student achievement of each outcome. So very basic assessment plan. I mean, something that we all do every day, you know, when we're teaching or creating a lesson plan or, or developing a course. So it's all things that we do um, easily and often. So in learning, uh, in identifying student learning outcomes, you really want to define those learning outcomes in terms of what a student should know, what they should um, think, do, or value as a result of completing the program. And the focus is measuring on what students actually learn and not what you're intending to deliver. So I could intend to deliver, you know, um, how to throw a clay pot, I don't know, but what do they actually learn? You know, so you have your expectations, you have your, your goals and objectives, but you're really measuring what they've actually accomplished in reality. So that's really the, the area that you're measuring. And for me, <laughs> um, you know, I like to start with anytime I'm doing a plan that requires some kind of action, I do start with an action verb and I'm gonna show you um, one of the documents that's available that I'm gonna send to you. And basically you say that if you're like me, you might find prompts useful. Um, I certainly would love to be so facile as to pull great things out of thin air, um, goals and objectives and all that kind of thing, but that's really not my strength. I rely on notes, prompts, my teammates, collaboration um, to keep me moving in the direction that I want and need to go in. So let me click on the action verbs to write student outcomes. And like I say, this is these are things that a lot of us are already doing. This is really for those folks who may need some help or just need some a little push. So when you go into action verbs to write student outcomes, you can see here that it comes from Bloom's and we go through the taxonomy and then really describing what those pieces are and then the verbs that you would use maybe to um, define those pieces. So like I say, not trying to be ignorant or um, anything like that, but these are some tools that are that may be helpful that people have asked us for. And so that's why we're addressing it in this session today. And then practical assessment. So focus on selecting three to six of the most important learning outcomes. Um, I would say don't take on too much to analyze. You know, we all have limited time and resources. We certainly need to maintain a good work-life balance. And so I think if you look at some key outcomes, three to six of the most important, it's good. It's going to get the job done. You're going to have good, reliable, valid data. You know, having more outcomes doesn't necessarily equal better data, um, and it might confuse the pool. So for me, I like to keep it simple, direct, manageable, um, because it's more likely that you'll continue to do it, and you can really focus on several areas of change. When I would teach a class, you know, and I wanted to try something new or I wanted to change something in that course, I certainly didn't revamp uh, two-thirds or a half of the course, I might try one or two things and then change it up in the following semester and so on and so forth to see what worked, what didn't work. And so small adjustments, small changes um, is more important than any kind of overhaul. And it gives you the opportunity to kind of play with things that you might wanna do. And in terms of accreditation, the thing that they frown on is if you say, well, two, semester ago, two semesters ago, I did X, Y, Z as opposed to, well, two semesters ago, I did AB, and then I tried it again, and then I tried it again. It's really just demonstrating to them that you are doing continuous improvement and that you're in the process and that's going to get us more of a green check mark than saying something like, well, you know, I did this wonderful thing a couple of years ago and it works so great that I haven't done anything else. So just keep that in mind, but keep it simple, keep it direct and manageable, um, and it'll be much less painful. <laughs> um, and then, of course, you want to think about how you're going to collect and analyze your data. So those are things to figure out. And in doing that, I would say that multiple methods of assessing outcomes is more recommended. Um, and like in my example, you know, administering a subject area test along with observing performance, maybe in a simulated situation, will give you feedback on both knowledge and application. So in using the one thing, you might be able to get 
um, multiple methods or multiple streams of data and information, um, which you know is going to make it a little more easier to manage for you. And then when we really talk about um, direct versus indirect assessments, really want to try to use direct measures. Direct measures require students to represent, reproduce, or demonstrate their learning. And then indirect is more about perceptions and experiences and attitudes. And so many accrediting agencies really require that direct measures be used as a primary evidence um, in the assessment of student learning. Indirect measures certainly can serve as supporting evidence, but the focus should really be on uh, direct measures. So when defined within the context of, of degree programs, academic and student support services, direct assessment measures um, really capture a student's actual performance in a way uh, that demonstrates specific learning has occurred. So direct, me uh, direct assessment measures um, really help to provide key insights into what students can do, which then equals strong evidence of student learning. And the strength of this measure of, of direct assessment lies in the fact that it requires, student to uh, requires students to produce work so that the extent to which learning um, has occurred and the expectations, you know, can be looked at to see if they've been met. Um, and then we can kind of evaluate and see how they did. So direct assessments, always better. Indirect assessments to support some of that. And as an example, um, here's some direct assessment examples. And I won't read them to you, but you can see um, in those examples, they're very finite sorts of concrete pieces of evidence. And I think it's it's really good. Now, you know, even, even on reflection papers, if everyone does a reflection, even though it is a reflection, um, you're pointing them in the direction of reflecting on what, how, and why they learn. So that, that's a valuable artifact to use in terms of analyzing um, that data. Now, student course evaluations. Um, I formerly worked at Temple University. I worked at Rowan. I know at Temple, there was a lot of uh, discussion about stopping student course evaluations because they found that they really uh, weren't that effective. And so even though it's a commonly used evaluation technique, a student course evaluation really does not measure student learning. Um, so, you know, it really is not a, it's an indirect kind of a piece. Um, and it has, it doesn't provide the kind of data that direct assessment does. And so for things like student course evaluations, um, you know, uh, you could do um, student self-assessments of their gains and knowledge or their skills intended as a result of taking the course. So again, more of maybe a reflection piece um, to support the direct assessment. But student course evaluations really aren't a good measure of student learning. And some of these are also not good indicators of student learning. So graduation rates, completing the program isn't really a measure of what students learned, but completions could be a goal that you may set for yourself and you may say have you know, X number of completions. So there is some indirect support for that. And then GPA, it also isn't really a measure of what students have learned in the program. Um, so, you know, just give that some thought. And then in terms of um, assessment logistics, now I have a, a lot on this slide, but these are the kinds of things that you wanna think about. Um, how often will the assessment be conducted? So again, back to your situation, is it gonna be something that's longitudinal, something that's more regular? Uh, what learning experiences are you going to include? You know, and then if you're just gonna take a sample, I mean, if you have a lot of classes and a lot of students, you may not wanna just do the whole group, but you may pick a sample, maybe across courses or in a course. Um, who's going to develop the scoring rubric? You may already have one. Um, what steps, you know, are you going to take? And if it's aggregate data, you're really not going to have student information, so there's no um, worry about identity of students. And then, of course, who will conduct the assessment? That's generally the faculty member. 
if you have stu- if you have judges of student um, work. Now, I didn't include the rubric, but I do have a rubric. I think that is based on the NIH for evaluating uh, things like that. But if you have student, if you have judges that kind of evaluate student work, there's a whole process. So if you're interested in doing that kind of a thing, just reach out to us and then we can help you with that. And then the rest of it, you know, how you're gonna store and analyze the data, who's gonna ensure that these things take place in a timely way, and then how are you gonna report the data? Now, some of this may come to light depending on what Dr. Smith is doing um, in her role. And I'm sure that there is going to be a repository of some type and then requirements for uh, submitting data to that repository. So stay tuned. And then assessment schedule, you know, developing the schedule again, um, and then really having a plan. So not to repeat myself, but it really is having an assessment schedule, an assessment plan, developing that artifact, and uh, really in short, um, you know, having your mission statement, defining your learning outcomes, designing your methods, multiple methods, determining your schedule, and then finally creating and updating that assessment document regularly for continuous improvement and then submitting it um, wherever it needs to go so that it can be a part of the accreditation process. Now, the next slide um, is about resources. And I'll pull each one of these up again. If you're interested, I'll send them to the group um, unless you're not interested, but I will send all of the PDFs. So the first PDF you saw with the action verbs, oh, I guess I have one. And then the other three. So again, oops, the action verbs to um, write student outcomes. Now there's a learning outcomes and assessment measures checklist and I got this information really from Stanford and from Missouri State, I think, who repurposed it. But it is a good um, tool I found. And so it's a learning outcomes and checklist. And uh, let me see if I can, there we go. So it really talks about defining them, constructing them, examples, you know, curriculum math, and then the measures checklist. So it is a helpful tool. If you don't have one in place, um, it's good to use it to create things, you know, for your assessment. Depth of a knowledge chart, I also find interesting. I happen to like this document, but there um, really talks about depth of knowledge levels, and then it gives you levels of activities, you know, and then um, talks about recall and strategic thinking, extended thinking, and so it may be a tool that you find useful as well. And again, these are just suggestions and tools to help you do um, what you want to do. And then finally, I have a helpful references sheet. These are some of the references that I use for this presentation. Um, and they're not all current, but they are still good tools to use and it's good information. Um, if you want a more current listing, I do have some more of those as well, but this is sort of what I found to be really helpful for uh, this presentation. And again, um, that pretty much concludes the information that I have. I know it was kind of a lot to throw at you. Um, and I hope it answered the question from the faculty that I had in terms of what student um, learning outcomes were and are and how to go about uh, gathering that data, planning to gather that data, and so on and so forth. Um, we're here in e-learning every day, Monday through Friday. You can reach us uh, via e-learning at cameroncc.edu. You can call us, you can come in. We have a couple of faculty spaces and adjunct faculty spaces that you can actually work in. Um, we have a training room and we have computers actually in the suite too. So we can actually give you one-on-one -on -one help to send us an email. We'd more than help, happy to help you do whatever it is that you wanna do in terms of your course or planning for assessing your course, anything you wanna do, building your course, um, any issues you might have, we are here. We're certainly here to help you. So at this point, um, I'm going to open it up for questions. And so uh, if you could put it in the chat, that'd probably be easier with the webinar version. I'm going to um, move it over here and then uh, we can go from there. Let me see if I can open up the chat.
Oops. Alrighty, well, that is the end of my presentation. If you have any questions, um, please feel free to ask or to email. Oh, wait, here we go. That there's a couple of questions coming in. Um, are there any examples? So Deb uh, Susarzik, I hope I didn't mutilate your name. Are there any examples available that show a schedule assessments for any area department program? I can see, I believe that there may be something that the deans of each of the divisions have. So let me find out um, from them if they have it. If not, I will get some examples to you. Um, and then uh, for Edward Ramirez Wright, absolutely, I can send you a copy of the slides um, today and also send you the, the resources. They are linked in the slides, but I'll attach the PDFs as well and send them. So I will try to get examples in terms of the schedule of assessments and I will certainly get you a copy of the slides. Um, and this will be recorded by TLC. I believe Elena Bogardis is in attendance. And um, it does get posted, I believe, to the TLC um, you know, section so that you can access this. And if you didn't see the previous session at convocation, I believe that's there as well um, that Jenny and I did, that they uh, recorded. So yep. Absolutely, Deb. I will send the links and slides to everybody that attended. Um, and if there's no other question, thank you so much for attending. Thank you so much for your time. I do hope that this was helpful. And if you want to do a deeper dive in any of the things that I covered, please reach out to us. Um, it's easier, I think, for us to uh, do that kind of work, you know, one on one. So thanks, Jamie. Thanks, Deb. Uh, have a great afternoon, and I'm going to give you back your time. I know it's a really busy time for everybody. And again, we're here to help you, so please reach out. Don't hesitate, and we will see you at the next webinar. Thank you.